Welcome to another series of sermons on the greatness of the kingdom. One of our textbooks has been The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva J. McLean. Presently we're studying the Apocalypse, the, the uh, book of Revelation. We're in the tenth chapter. We're going to do just a little bit of review before we go there, and we're going to have a reading in the book of Hebrews, which I think is very beautiful, relating to all of what Christ did. In the ninth chapter, we saw a 200 million person army come against Israel from the east. I want to ask you, I wish I had a large map out here, but what nation is east of Israel or Jerusalem? Now, I read just a moment, for just a moment, that at one time they thought this was, that this was a red Chinese army coming against them where they could be 200 million people. That nation that is east of Jerusalem is Arabia. Arabia. Now, there are 1.5 billion, 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. I think they could probably muster up a 200 million person army without any problem. We have studied the scriptures from the Bible compared to the Jehovah Witness end times, compared to the Seventh-day Adventist end times, to the Mormon end times. And we've also studied Islam. Islam, the Quran, the Hadiths, and the Ahadiths, and the Sunnahs all say one thing. The Islam end time believes that there's going to be a Mahdi, the Iman Mahdi, the twelfth Iman, that's going to come about. He's going to gather his forces. He will be 40 years old. He'll be a reluctant leader at first when they swear allegiance to him. He will bring the world. He will begin to bring the world into the last caliphate under Islamic rule. This is what Islam says. He would always, <coughs> he will also be accompanied by a beast which will come out of Arabia near Mecca according to the Quran, etc. That this beast will mark all the true believers of Islam with a mark or what they call the statement of faith. There is no God but Allah. He has no companions and Muhammad is his messenger or prophet or apostle. Then Jesus will come forth, the Jesus or Issa of Islam, and he will kill all the Jews. He will break the cross, kill all the Christians. And the whole synopsis of the Islamic eschatology is that they will bring in the world under one caliphate, under one religion, which is Islam, which means surrender. The Mormons... Their philosophy is Revelation 6 and 1. They have a white, horse, a white horse prophecy that Joseph Smith prophesied. I could have read this to you also. But in synopsis, it says that the Mormon church will rescue America that has gone away from the Constitution, the original Constitution, and that they will financially buy back America out of debt that they will rule America from their prophet, their apostle, on this white horse of Revelation 6 chapter. Now, the Antichrist is Revelation 6 chapter. The, the Antichrist that comes forth conquering the conquer corresponds to the Islamic Iman, uh, the Iman Mahdi, and it corresponds to uh, the Mormon philosophy that they will have a, an apostle, a prophet of God that will come in and restore America. Glenn Beck is one of their spokesmen. He keeps pushing this. They spent millions and billions of dollars trying to elect their man to president the last time. He's still not quiet in the background today. Maybe they'll try to get him to be a vice president or whatever. But they're going to bail America out. They're going to go back to the Constitution. This is the whole story. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are going to let it all happen because they want to go to the kingdom. Well, to go to the kingdom, you've got to go through the tribulation period. And right now, we have a parenthetical chapter between 
the trumpets of six and seven trumpets. And that's the tenth chapter of the book of Revelation. The tenth chapter of Revelation. Now, if this army comes from the east like the Bible says it's going to be, and it's going to be 200 million strong, it would nothing be nothing for Islam to do that. That would not be hard to do at all. Saudi Arabia is the stronghold of Islam. Many times people have tried to revise or reform Islam. Saudi Arabia said we will not do it. It's been revised too many times. We're going to stick to it. So they have a group there that have gone back to basics of Islam. ISIS is real Islam today. That's what Muhammad called for. Now let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the, uh, the first chapter. And we're going to start out with verse number 14. Now, we've gone over chapter 1 here that it talks about Jesus. In the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation, we have an angel there, which people aren't exactly sure who he is. So I'm going to go over here to the book of, of uh, Hebrews and see what Hebrews says. In verse number 5, it says, To which of the angels did he say ever? Thou art my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Now, by the way, the angels of God are only supposed to worship one person, and that is God, by the way. And the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, that's cherubim, and ministers of fire, that's seraphim. But of the Son, he says, Thou throne, O God, is forever. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteousness scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. We're talking about the, the kingdom of God there, the what we call the millennial kingdom, and then the eternal kingdom to come. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above all your companions. And then it says, You, Lord, in the beginning did play, lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will become old as a garment and as a mantle. You will roll them up, and as a garment they will also be changed. But you are the same and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit thou on the right hand until I make my enemies my, your footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits, angels and spirits? There are ministering spirits and there are angels. Sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation. We have now, we have what I call our guardian angels and ministering spirits. Now, in the ch second chapter, it says, For this reason we must pay most closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For if the words spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation after it was at first spoken through the Lord? It was confirmed to us through those who heard it, God also bearing witness with them with both signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. For he did not, subject to any, he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you have concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than angels. You have crowned him. Now, in the uh, Septuagint, it says a little lower than Elohim, not angels. A little lower than Elohim. He was in the person less than God, but in, he was still God. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him 
over the works of your hands. You have put all things subject under his feet. In subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. It says Jesus was temporarily and briefly humbled. But we do see him who had been made for a little while lower than Elohim, namely Jesus, because the suffering death, the suffering of death, angels don't die, God doesn't die, but Jesus had to be able to die to our substitutionary death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the cosmos, he's going to redeem it all back to himself. All except unredeemable mankind. Unredeemable angels. Suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom all things and through whom all things and, and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of our salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers. And saying, I will proclaim thy name in, to thy brethren in the midst of the congregation, in that church which he did right after the Lord's Supper. And I will sing thy praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children whom God has given me. Since then the children of share in the flesh. Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. And that is the devil. And might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That's a beautiful, beautiful reading of Scripture. That's our Savior. That's our God. That's our Savior, and that is our God, and that's our Jesus. Now let's go to the tenth chapter of the book of Revelation. In the last chapter, we see... Uh, the 200 million man army coming against Israel. We're here between the 6th and the 7th trumpets. Uh, Israel has, is fleeing to the desert. The Lord told them to flee to the desert. The Lord is going to protect them. And now we have an angel or we have the Lord. This is a parenthetical chapter. An interception between 10 and 1 and 11 14. Between the 6th and the 7th trumpets. And behold, another angel, strong, having come down out of the heaven, having been clothed or flung around with a cloud of the rainbow. In other words, he's going to have a, a rainbow halo on him upon the head. And the word rainbow means iris. Uh, the, uh, we have an iris in our eyes. That's the color in our eyes. This rainbow around the head of this angel or person of God. Now I want to tell you something. This mighty angel is permitted to appear wearing the same clothing as God wears. So you can take your opinion of this and do whatever you want to with it. I think this is Jesus. Some people think it's Michael. I really believe myself that it's Jesus. I will not push that point upon anyone. That's what my opinion is. And the rainbow crown upon the head of him and the face of him as the sun, the helios as the sun and the feet of him as pillars of fire. We see this in, in descriptions in the book of Daniel, in the book of Ezekiel. We see this. And having in the hand of him a little scroll, a diminutive scroll, it's Babla Ridion. Bebla Redion, having been opened up, and he placed the foot of him, the right, upon the sea, and the left upon the earth, the land, the dry land. 
And he cried out in a voice great, just as a lion roars. Just as a lion he roars. And when he cried out, they spoke and talked in human speech the seven thunders. And the ones themselves voices. And when they spoke the seven thunders, I kept on being about to write. And I heard a voice out of the heaven saying, You seal the things which is they spoke. Seal up the things which they spoke. Seal it up. Number 4B. And the seven thunders, and not them you may write. Do not write these things down. Don't write what you heard. 10 and verse 5. And the angel whom I saw, uh, the one having stood upon the sea and upon the earth, the dry land, he lifted up the hand of him to the right, the right hand of him unto heaven. We see this so many times when people are baptized. The, bab the baptizer will raise his hand up and it says in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you by the authority of whatever church in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then they're dipped and they die to their old self and they're raised anew in newness in Christ. That's like what happened here with the angel. He, he raised his hand up to heaven and he swore. He fenced himself in by the one living, the uh, eternal one. Of the ages of the ages, ace tus ionos ton ionon. The one, uh, the eternal one. John 1 1 says, In beginning, he kept on being the word, ho logos, and there it should be, it comes right straight from the Hebrew, ha the bar, which means literally the Jehovah. They were afraid to speak his name, so they put ha the bar down, or ha shem, the name or the word. And so when John wrote, he wrote with a Hebraism, not a Greek idea. In beginning, kept on being the Word, the Jehovah, and the Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead because the Word kept on being God. The Jehovah kept on being God. NRK ain't ho logos. Kai ho logos ain't proston theon. Kai ho logos ain't theos. He kept on being God. Jesus never ceased being God, and yet he was in human form. He was God and man. The one, the eternal one, who created the heaven and the things in it and the earth also and the things in it, in her literally, and the sea and the things in her, because time no longer shall be. There will be no more marked off piece of eternity now. Time is going to cease. This is the answer to uh, Revelation 6, 10 to 11. Cross references as, it, as Exodus 6 and 8 and 20 and 11, Numbers 14, uh, 30, Ezekiel 20 and verse 5, Revelation 4 and 9, 4, 11, 6, 11, 12, 12, 16 and 17 and 2 and 6. Revelation 10 and verse 7. Strong adversity of conjunction, but Allah. All in tas and And during the days, or in the days of the sound of the seventh angel, during the sounding of that seventh angel, when it was about to trumpet, and it was finished, the mystery, the secret of the God, as he preached, evangelized to the ones of himself slaves and the prophets. He preaches the gospel that has been written down by the prophets. This angel does. He's preaching the gospel from heaven. 10.8 And the voice which I heard, the sound which I heard out of the heaven, again kept on speaking in human language with me and saying, You go, you take the, the little scroll, the little book, the Biblion, the one having been opened up, in the hand of the angel, the one having stood upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went away toward the angel, saying to them, 
give to me the little scroll. And he says to me, and I'm reading and translating this directly out of Greek to you. That's why it's a little stumbly. You take and you eat down. Eat it down. It and it will become bitter. Pikrane. It will become pikranao. Bitter to you in the stomach. But in the mouth of you it shall be sweet gluco gluco Hos mele. Sweet, that's where we get our word glucose. Sweet as honey, mele. John wanted to see judgment upon these God hating people, and it was sweet to him as he saw God bringing that judgment, but after John saw how terrible that judgment was, it was better dose of medicine to his stomach. Jeremiah 15 and verse 6, Ezekiel 2 8 and 3 1 2 3. 10 and verse 10. And I received, I took the little book, the little scroll, out of the hand of the angel. And I ate it, and it kept on being in the mouth of me as honey, sweet, gluco. And when I ate it, it was very bitter in the stomach of me. Very bitter in the stomach of me. Now we're going to have a coming in chapter 11. Now this is a legitimate prophetic utterance, number one. What's coming up in chapter 11 is a great city, which indeed is Jerusalem. The time periods are literal time. The two witnesses are two real people. The three and a half days are three and a half days. The earthquake is literal. The 7,000 men are 7,000 men. The death of the two witnesses is literal. The resurrection of the two witnesses is literal. And chapter 11 continues the parenthetical section of chapter 10, a continuation of the same subject as in chapter 10. Let's go to verse number 11 now. Now this is a real controversial verse. Many people think that John is going to be one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. I have and I will read to you many people's ideas of who the two witnesses were. Are We shall get to them. And they say to me, it is bindingly necessary for you again to prophesy before peoples and nations and languages. His prophecy will be heard by people in multiple language media and to kings many. Now we come to the two witnesses. The two witnesses. There's a lot of controversy over who these two witnesses are. 11 and verse 1. And it was given to me a kolomos, a reed, homios, like a rod, a rabdo, saying, you rise up and you measure the shrine of God, the dwelling place of God, and the sacrificial altar and the ones worshiping in it, literally in him. I'll read what I wrote about these two witnesses. There is much speculation concerning the two witnesses of Revelation. I personally have no opinion who they are. I don't know. Many people say, I know who these two witnesses are. I don't. I can tell you who I don't believe they are. I don't believe they are Elijah and Enoch. Well, lots, well, that's what people say, Elijah and Enoch. Elijah and Enoch are a type of the rapture. Why would God send a type of the rapture back to die? Oh, it says it's in, in the book of Hebrews, it said it's unpunished man wants to die, and after that the judgment. Well, they didn't die. No, they're a type of the rapture. So I don't think that's Elijah and Enoch. But let me read to you some of these things. I will give some ideas that I have heard. If you agree with some of these, fine. But if you don't, you can share the state of limbo with me. Some believe that Zechariah will be one of the witnesses of Revelation, referring back to Zechariah 4 and 1 through 14. 
and Zerubbabel will be the, his fellow witness. Others believe that John and Daniel will be the two witnesses according to these two scriptures, John in Revelation 10 and 4 through 11 and Daniel 12, 13, or 4 through 13. Still yet, some believe that Elijah and Moses shall be the two witnesses of Revelation because they were raised to witness during the Christ ministry about his coming death, and therefore some believe that they shall do this same thing again during the tribulation period. Malachi 4 and 5, Matthew 17, 3 through 11, Mark 9 and 4, Mark 15, 35 through 36, Acts 1, 9 through 11. Some believe that the two witnesses that these two men to be Moses and Elijah, which I just read. Let me find my place. Still further, there are some who believe that Elijah and Enoch will be the two witnesses because they had never seen death. According to Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men all once to die. So if they are the two witnesses, they will meet their appointed death. This is what some people believe. They are a type of the rapture, so I do not believe that. They were a type of the rapture. John and Elijah representing the Old Testament and Elijah representing the Old Testament confirming that it was the word of God. Thus, during this time, some believe the tribulation period people will be preached to by New Testament or Old Testament prophets. Still some believe that the two witnesses will be two individuals that live during this tribulation period that God will use them to fulfill his purposes. Others believe that the two witnesses are the work of the of work of God, the Holy Spirit. God the work Holy Spirit. Let's see what else I've got down here. Oh, some believe it is Israel and the church, the two witnesses are. So we got, we got Zechariah, we've got Aaron, we've got Zerubbabel, we've got John, we've got Elijah, we've got Daniel, we've got Moses, we've got Enoch, we've got the church, we've got Israel, and we also have Paul. These are some of the ideas of who these two witnesses are. Now let's go to 11 and verse 2. And the court and the outside of the dwelling place, the shrine, you cast out outside and not it you may measure because it was given to the nation, to the Gentiles. And there the city, the holy, they shall trample down months 42, three and a half years. The miracles that these two witnesses do are a whole lot like what Moses did by the hand of Aaron. That's why some people think it's Aaron that comes back. Because of the same, the books are the miracles in the book of Revelation and in, in the uh, Exodus are very similar. 11 and verse 3. And I shall give to the two witnesses of me, and they shall prophesy days one thousand two hundred and sixty, having been clothed in sackcloth. Having been clothed in sackcloth. Maybe there are two angels. Except angels are hard to kill, you know. People say, well, maybe there's two angels. There are probably two men because they do die. They literally are two witnesses and they literally are killed. These ones, they are the two, the olive and the lampstands, the olive tree and the lampstands, the ones in the presence of the Lord of the earth having stood. Zechariah 14, 1 through 14, 4, 3, 11, 14, Jeremiah 11, 16. Is this Israel in the church? Very confusing, but I'm going to tell you something. These are two literal witnesses, whoever they are, two literal witnesses. 11 and 5. And if anyone, them he wishes to harm, 
Fire proceeds out of the mouth of them, and it devours, eats them down to the ground, the enemies of them. And if anyone he may wish them to harm in this same way, it is binding as necessary him to be killed. Second Kings 1, 10 through 12, Jeremiah 5, 14, Revelation 9, 17, Numbers 16, 29, and 35 are cross-references to this. Now, Elijah in 1 Kings 18, 36 through 39, these are like the miracles of Elijah. Jesus' disciples wanted him to call down fire out of heaven, as Elijah did in 2 Kings 1, 10 through 14, and Numbers uh, 16 and verse 35, where Korah was the Korah rebellion, the rebellion of Korah. 11 and 6. These ones, they have the authority, unlimited power, to shut and lock down the heaven. This power here is not limited at all. It means out of all limits. Nothing is unlawful for them. To shut the heaven in order that not rain it may fall during the days of the prophecy of them and the authority they have over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague. We got a word plague right in English out of this word plague. When? If they may wish. When and if they may wish. Whosoever and whatsoever they may wish. Balls has also called the waters to be turned to blood. Of course, we know that, that Aaron actually did it. Moses was a god to him. Aaron was a prophet. So many people think this is going to be Aaron. Maybe he'll finish his job. Who knows? And whenever they may finish, the witness of them, the beast, the Therion, this word is the swift moving beast, the one coming up out of the abyss, he shall make with them war. And he shall overcome them. And he shall kill them. Satan was the author of death in the Garden of Eden, wasn't he? Daniel 7.21 Satan thinks that if he has overcome God, but God shows Satan that he is stronger than death. And the God who never lost a single battle. Our God never lost a single battle. We serve the God that never lost a battle. And this is just one of those battles. The wrath of mankind is wicked. The wrath of God is holy. The wrath of mankind is wicked. The wrath of God is holy. 11 and verse 8. And the corpse of them upon the open street of the city of the great, which is called spiritually Sodom. Sodom. Sodom means a place of lime. And Egypt, where indeed the Lord of them, he was crucified. Now, who were was Jesus crucified? He's crucified in Jerusalem, so that's where these two witnesses have been been uh, witnessing. And Jerusalem is reprobate, like Sodom and Gomorrah, like Egypt. The progressive will of God, he permits some things to bring final glory to himself and his eternal purpose and unpreventable progress to go onward. 11 and verse 9. And they see among the peoples of tribes and languages and of nations the corpse of them Days three and one half. How are they going to do this? By modern media, you can do that. They're on the news. The news is, is on these corpses as they lay in the city of Jerusalem. Now, this is the type of the, de of, of the death of Christ. It's a type of the death of Jonah. The reason Christ was crucified on Wednesday, this statement settles all the controversy. And three and a half days, the corpses of them, the patomata, tomata of them, not they permitted to be placed in a tomb. They wouldn't allow them to be buried. 
They allowed, they, they demanded, they lay in the street. When I was in Damascus, Syria in 1975, I would walk down near the courthouse where they held the court trials. And out there in front of the courthouse, there was an archway. And above the, this archway in, the head, on the, in front of the courthouse was three ropes with three men hanging by the neck dead there. And they were, I was there nine days, and those bodies hung there for nine days. They did not have a burial. And the ones down homing upon the earth, they rejoice. They continue to rejoice over them. And they are glad and happy. They are in absolute euphoria. That's where it comes from. Euphra on all. And the gifts they shall send to one another, just like Christmas, just like Hanukkah, because these, the two prophets, they tormented the ones down homing upon the earth. Revelation 3.10, Nehemiah 8, 10 through 12, Esther 9, 19, 22 and 11, Ezekiel 37, 5, 9, 10 and 14. Israel has celebrated Hanukkah since about 185 B.C., but now the devil thinks he has won and he celebrates his Hanukkah, for he thinks he has overcome the Jews and God's witnesses. Hanukkah or a feast of lights Jesus celebrated in John 10 and verse 22. It was the uh, rededication of the temple after the Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated it with the swine flesh, and the Maccabees had liberated Israel from the Syrian control. And Hanukkah was instituted. Epiphanes forbade Israel to keep kosher, the Sabbath, circumcision, baptizing, or doing anything Jewish. He hated Judaism. He who laughs last, laughs best. Now, I want you to understand that. He who laughs last, laughs best. Now, since 185 B.C., the Jews have been uh, celebrating Hanukkah. That's where we get a modern Christmas today. 11 and verse 11. And after the three days and a half, the spirit of life out of the God it entered into them, and they stood... They stood up again. They were fallen, and they stood back up upon the feet of them. And the fear great, it fell upon the ones beholding them all over the world. Ezekiel 37, 5, 9, 10, and 14. 11 and 12. And they heard a voice great out of the heavens saying to them, You come up here. And they went up unto the heaven, into the cloud, and they beheld them, the enemies of them, and in that, the hour, it occurred, or it became an earthquake great. And the tenth of the city it fell, and they were killed by the earthquake, or in the earthquake, names of men, 7,000, and the ones remaining, terrified they became, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. Revelation 6 and 12, 8, 5, 11, 19, 16, 18, 14, 7, 16, 9, 19, 7, 16, and 11. John 9, 24. Glory of God out of heaven. 11 and verse 14 now. 11 and verse 14. Hey, hey, uah, hey, de terra, apelte. The woe, the second, it passed away. You behold the woe, the third. It is coming suddenly, instantly, instantaneously. We got a word taxi out of this word toxu or toxi. It's coming for itself, by the way, Erkatai. 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel, he sounded his trumpet. Now we've got the seventh trumpet over there. And they became voices great in the heaven, saying, it became the kingdom of the world of the Lord of us and the Christ of him, and he shall reign unto the ages of the ages. Now this is the scripture that the last of the week bunch used to say that the rapture is at the last of the week. But we got problems with that. We got a lot of problems with that. Nobody is going to go into the kingdom of God, the millennial reign, that is lost. 
if the rapture takes place here, we've got a lot of people being saved all the way through here. Some of them are going to, many of them are going to die. Five out of six, six, six people are going to be killed. Two out of every three Jews are going to be killed. But there's going to be a remaining remnant. We have the parable of the tares and the wheat. We have the parable of the good and the bad fish, the dragnet, and we have the parable of the sheep and the goats. And that's when that takes place right here when Christ returns in glory and he judges these nations. The nations will be judged according to how they treated Israel. And of course, if they treated Israel correctly, that means they were saved. There will be some saved nations there. Now, if you get everybody saved and raptured here, who's going to go into the millennium? In the middle of the week, some of these people, there are going to be people saved during here and there, so that's possible. I didn't say right, but possible. The rapture at the pre-tribulation rapture is what I believe. The mid-tribulation rapture is possible. The end of the week rapture is impossible. Nobody will be there to go into the, the millennial kingdom, which will not be peopled by lost people at all. And it's going to be peopled by people and their bodies. Thank you for your attention today. We will finish right there at 11 and verse 15, and we'll start up there in our next study. Thank you for attending these sermons on the apocalypse and the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this time with God's people. Forgive us for your failure. Help us to glorify you with our lives. Protect us from all evil in this world. Help us to foot and guide every footstep that we take. Help us to glorify you and help us to do something eternal every week. In Jesus' name we pray. In your holy, holy name.